www.americanfamilynews.com. For American Family News, I'm Steve Tordall. I love AFR. You say it's on the radio, too? Here at American Family Radio, we know that many people find their audio entertainment in other places than the radio. So our programming is available with the AFR app on Apple and Android devices, through Amazon Alexa, and now available on Roku. I just love the podcasts. That, too. American Family Radio, streaming our podcast, now available wherever you are. And we're on the radio. Darkness is not an affirmative force. It simply reoccupies the space vacated by the light. This is the Hamilton Corner on American Family Radio. It should be uncomfortable for a believer to live as a hypocrite. Delivering people out of the bondage of mainstream media. And the philosophies of this world. God has called you and me to be his ambassadors. Even in this dark moment. Let's not miss our moment. And now, the Hamilton Corner. Good evening. Welcome to the Hamilton Corner here on American Family Radio. I'm your host, Abraham Hamilton III, and we finally... Finally have the full J Squared contingent back in studio today. Mr. Jeff Reed on my left, Mr. Jason Tross on my right, Marty Sparks lighting up the dark from the screening room. We're ready to rock and roll with another edition of the Hamilton Corner. Well, as most of you are making your way from your part-time jobs to your full-time jobs, ready to do that full-time work, but understanding that that work is not laborious, although it is a fully invested work, uh, I want to encourage you that family, serving the Lord faithfully within the context of our family, our families is ministry. The way that we husbands love, treat, serve, and cultivate our wives is ministry. The way uh, wives love, treat, submit to their husbands is ministry. The way parents serve as the anchors, the fulcrum for evangelism and discipleship for their children with the father as the head of the home. Um, I know in this politically correct time, people don't like to talk about that. But newsflash, I ain't politically correct. Fathers have been established and ordained by God to be the heads of their families. The world may try to spin that into some type of machismo. I say machismo. Machismo, a chauvinism, uh, but godly headship. There's nothing chauvinistic about it. In fact, most women, almost every woman that I know, uh, when you consider biblical manhood, they say amen. Amen. So, you know, I don't take my uh, marching orders from talking snakes and people that deny the truth of God's word, you know? But family is the first institution create, created by God as, as recipients of his delegated authority and given the responsibility to execute the king's dominion in the earth. That was given to a husband and a wife with the capacity to bear offspring. That is instructive for us. And as I say repeatedly, repeatedly, we, we cannot seek to receive God's results by sidestepping God's ways. Yeah. <laughs> Just sit with that one for a moment. I know I sit with it often. We want God's results. Eh, we're going to offer an, am an amendment to his ways. It don't work like that. It don't work like that. So as you're making that transition, and thankfully you're listening to the Hamilton Corner, and I certainly do appreciate you tuning in all the different ways you do so, video sh live stream on the Book of Faces on the Hamilton Corners YouTube channel, uh, the radio. Uh, man, it's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing all of the people that reach out from radio. They don't, don't get a chance to comment on the video live streams, but I get messages. I get them, and I know I'm kind of slow in responding to them because, honestly, it's so many messages, it's hard to get to all of them. Uh, but Twitter, some people watch through the video live streams on Twitter. Um, the AFR audio live stream on AFR.net. You have the AFR app. Um, so even if you don't have a radio station in your area that carries the program, listen, everybody has smartphones nowadays. You can forget the radio. Forget if a, there's a tower in your area carrying a station. You be your own tower. 
by downloading that AFR app from anywhere. You have iOS software, Android software. It's available to you. So thank you so much for listening to that program. But, man, let us be about our Father's business beginning in Jerusalem. Of course, we will work from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world, but we're not going to neglect Jerusalem. Let it not be said of us, Hamilton Corner listeners, members of the body of Christ, that we spent ourselves attempting to win the world yet neglected our own home. Let's reverse that, man. Let's discharge faithfulness unto the Lord. That's what, has, that's what we have to remember. When we minister, we're ministering unto the Lord. The particular individuals who are present in the various contexts, they happen to be present for our ministry unto the Lord. And having that proper understanding will enable us and empower us to first understand appropriately and secondarily uh, to discharge that faithfulness so that though storms may be raging everywhere else, by God's grace and his mercy, there's no storms raging in our home. Praise be to God. Well, we're going to begin today in Ezekiel chapter 3. This is something that's been on my heart. I've been chewing on this for quite some time. Uh, and by God's grace, I'd like to share it with you. Ezekiel chapter 3. Uh, Ezekiel uh, served in prophetic ministry to the uh, exiled Israelites, those who were conquered under Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon at the time, and then exiled to Babylon. So Ezekiel didn't have a ministry in Israel publicly, I would say. Didn't have a public ministry in Israel. He uh, began public ministry in Babylon. That is what the Bible tells us. And we're going to pick up a chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. I want to just share something with you from there. Here we go. Chapter, Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 1. And he, God, said to me, Son of man, eat whatever you find here. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he gave me this scroll to eat. And he said to me, son of man, feed your belly with this scroll that I give you and fill your stomach with it. Then I ate it and it was in my mouth as sweet as honey. And he said to me, son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. For you are not sent to a people of foreign speech and a hard language, but to the house of Israel. Not to many peoples of foreign speech and a hard language whose words you cannot understand. Surely if I sent you to such, surely if I sent you to such, they would listen to you. <laughs> but the house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you, for they are not willing to listen to me. Because all the house of Israel have a hard forehead and a stubborn heart. Behold, I have made your face as hard as their, their faces. And your forehead is hard as their forehead. Like emery, harder than flint have I made your forehead. Fear them not, nor be dismayed at their looks, for they are a rebellious house. Moreover, he said to me, son of man, all my words that I shall speak to you, receive in your heart and hear with your ears and go to the exiles to your people and speak to them and say to them, thus says the Lord God, whether they hear or refused to hear. Then the spirit lifted me up, and I heard behind me the voice of a great earthquake. Blessed be the glory of the Lord from its place. It was the sound of the wings of the living creatures as they touched one another, and the sound of the wheels beside them, and the sound of a great earthquake. The spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit, and the hand of the Lord being strong upon me. And I came to the exiles at Tel Abib, who were dwelling by the Chebar Canal, and I sat where they were dwelling, and I sat there overwhelmed among them seven days. Now, there's so much I could go into here, but I just want to make two primary points. Uh, first thing, the first thing I want to say is that something that I've been praying for the body of Christ um, is that we would not be weary, but that just as the Lord, that we would not get weary, but that just as the Lord uh, provided Ezekiel, he said, I'm sending you to a hard-headed, rebellious people. And it's important to understand the context. He's talking specifically about the generation of Israelites uh, who were so rebellious that they were exiled in the complete contravention of Deuteronomy 28. You know, uh, when those, if you would hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord your God to obey all that I command you this day, uh, when the enemy comes against you one way, they flee before you seven ways. When in contravention of that, uh, then the Deuteronomy 28 has 14 verses of blessings that are conditional. Read the chapter. But if you don't hearken diligently to the Lord, of God, to, Lord your God to obey him, all of these curses will befall you. 28 curses that are listed, double the amount of blessings. 
By the time that Nebuchadnezzar comes on the scene and the, and the Israelites are, are exiled, and it's important to know that Israel, Ezekiel is not the only prophet to this generation of Israelites. The Lord had several, but I just want to focus on Ezekiel today. Uh, they were exiled because they had, they had rebelled against Yahweh. And, and the Lord told Ezekiel, I'm sending you to a hard-headed people, man. They're stubborn. They're hard-headed. But don't worry, I've made your head harder. So don't be afraid of their faces because you are going to be speaking my word. I mean, I've given you the scroll. You've consumed the scroll. It, it was sweet to your belly. I have given you my word, but they're not going to heed your voice. But don't stop speaking my word. Yeah, there's a rebellious people. You're going to be on the outskirts. People are going to get tired of hearing you uh, proclaim the oracles of God. Keep doing it. My prayer has been that we would not be wearied by this culture that we find ourselves in. But that, as I stated earlier on, we recognize that our ministry is as unto the Lord. And because of our, com our vertical commitment, that vertical commitment, that vertical communion, that vertical fidelity results in us being consistently engaged horizontally among men. Second point I want to make, and this is something huh, that I think needs to become more prevalent in our day, in our time, because I've, I've found that on many different fronts, we have allowed the cultural standards of the world to seep into what we believe, think, and expect even within the church. Notice, the Lord gave Ezekiel his scroll. He consumed the scroll, recognized it as being sweet to his tummy, has the word of God, ordained and called to be a prophet, but he begins his public prophetic ministry not by yapping. He didn't immediately go up and say, oh, now the Lord has called me. I'm about to go give him, give him two cents. I'm going to let him all know. He begins his public prophetic ministry. How? Seven days of silence. Not saying a word. Now, in our modern context, most of us, <laughs> now I won't say most of us, some of us have somebody that has two seconds worth of revelation, and now they're starting the podcast. Now, now, they put out a hit song, and you got a pastor in Atlanta, let them come and preach the sermon. T.I., <clears throat> excuse me, who ain't even a Christian in my opinion. That's a whole other story. He begins with seven days of silence. Now, why am I saying that? A, a gifting from God does not determine the context for its usage. Now, in the world's eyes, well, hey, yo, you call to God. You're supposed to have a platform. You got to be up in front of folks. You got to be, you know, where's your website? Where's your face? Where's your social media print? Where's, what, you got to have all this stuff going on if you got it, you gifted from the Lord. Not so, folks. The Lord doesn't rock like the world rocks. The quality of your gift isn't determined by the quantity of your audience. Where do we get that from? Some of us, quite frankly, if the Lord has gifted you to teach, the Lord really wants you to use your teaching gifting for your children. Now, I know some people get uncomfortable with me saying that. Some, some of us, the Lord is saying, listen, don't allow your gift or even a public perception of your gift to manipulate you into missing what the Lord really has for us. See, in the kingdom of God, we don't evaluate ourselves, nor do we evaluate other people, nor do we evaluate things the way the world does. Didn't the Lord tell us that through Apostle Paul? See, we no longer regard any man after the flesh. See, in the body of Christ, we don't get goosebumps because somebody has a law, big name. We shouldn't, at least. We shouldn't. The thing that drives our engagement shouldn't be the SARS of the platform. You know, ain't no such thing as blue check marks in the kingdom of God. You hear what I'm saying? Ooh, man, they have a blue check mark on so Ooh, they verify. Ooh, ooh, boy. Ooh, boy, look at, look, look at that. Ain't no such thing as a blue check mark in the kingdom. You know what kind of check mark you need from the Lord? I mean, in the kingdom of God? The one from the Lord. <laughs> the one who knows, hears, and sees all. The one who says... <laughs> Don't pray like the Pharisees. You know, they get out in the streets. They want to make sure everybody can hear and see what they're saying. That's not how things work in the kingdom of God, man. So what I'm simply saying, just as an example we have from Elijah, 
He was just as much a prophet of Yahweh when he's confronting the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel as he was when he was by the brook Cherith being fed by Raven. And then from the brook Cherith, he goes to a widow picking up sticks. You want to talk about a downgrade? At least you can depend on the ravens. How are you going to depend on a, on a widow woman? What I'm saying, folks, is don't allow your perception even of your gift to manipulate you away from what God may be requiring of you. And I can tell you that there are many children who would really benefit from your teaching gifting if you would welcome its usage starting in your Jerusalem. Local library or house of horrors. I am Matt Staver with Freedom's Call. Apparently the new goal of libraries is for kids to check out hideous trash. The American Library Association recently held its annual national conference. The ALA provided librarians from across the country with some disgusting strategies. Their master plan included bringing LGBT propaganda, pornography, and drag queen story times for children into the libraries. And all of this is supposed to be done under the radar while avoiding parents' knowledge. Because according to the ALA, one of the top five methods of so-called censorship librarians face is needing parental consent. The ALA's agenda is terrifying. This exposure to dangerous and disturbing ideas can cause lifelong harm to impressionable children, not to mention it's actively grooming them for sexual abuse. Check out what your local library is doing and stay informed at Liberty Council's website, lc.org. Back to Genesis with Dr. John Morris, scientist and creation researcher with the Institute for Creation Research. Dr. Morris, when did the mammoths die? Chris, the mammoths were thought to have died out about 10,000 years ago. And although evolutionists have admitted that early man must have seen the mammoths, more recent evidence has caused them much consternation. In the tomb of one of the pharaohs in Egypt is a drawing of men carrying ivory tusk on their shoulders. Next to them is an animal that sure looks like a mammoth, with hairy skin and a domed head just like we see in mammoth fossils. And why not? Mammoths are a variety of the elephant kind, and two of them were on board Noah's Ark. Certainly humans knew of them, and from the earliest times have made use of their ivory. Chris, it's the back to Genesis view of history which makes sense out of the evidence. To learn more about creation, get our free DVD called That's a Fact. Visit our web store at icr.org slash store and use the promo code FACT at the checkout when ordering your That's a Fact DVD. Brian Fisher here with today's Life and Liberty Minute. One of the unfortunate casualties of our digital culture is the death of the family meal. Dads, you need to take the lead in seeing to it that your family has dinner together as often as possible. It's good for you, and it's good for your kids. A study from New Zealand shows that junior high students who enjoy frequent family meals have higher levels of emotional well-being and lower levels of depression. In Iran, believe it or not, adolescents who have regular family meals are less likely to suffer from anxiety, insomnia, and all types of mental disorders. Family meals are linked to lower levels of suicide and higher levels of self-esteem among adolescents and among adults who shared family meals when they were adolescents. Hey, if it works in Iran, it'll work here. Bon Appetit. Catch Brian Fisher on Focal Point, weekday afternoons at 105 Central on American Family Radio. Shining light into the darkness, this is the Hamilton Corner on American Family Radio. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back to the Hamilton Corner here on American Family Radio. Abraham Hamilton III here. I always get a crack. Uh, it's about my, my good friend Miki at the Marriage, Family, and Life Conference. He was referring to my wife. She called her Maria Hamilton III. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> that was funny to me. But in case you're wondering, I am the third. So if you learn my name, you already know my dad's and my grandfather's name. Mm -hmm. And my great-grandfather's name is Benjamin. And he instructed my, my, my grandfather to make sure that my dad knew you weren't named after Abraham Lincoln. You were named after Abraham in the Bible. Anyway, it's a little Hamilton factoid. I guess nobody really even wanted to do that. But what's on deck? Foolishness du jour. Well, and I, I'm, I, it pains me to even say this because I, I don't like do th doing this, but I do this for y'all, man, because I, I love y'all so much. Tonight is round two, part one of the Democrat presidential debate. Oh, how I loathe to watch these debates. 
But I feel like I have to do it for my job. Look at Marty. He's like, I'm so glad you do it, Abraham, because uh, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. Goodness gracious, but I got to do it. So round two, part one tonight, because, you know, if you haven't heard yet, the Democrats have 1,753 people running for the presidency. Not literally, but it feels like that. So they have to break the, break the debate up into two different days to where I think it's 10 candidates on one day, 10 candidates on another day. So tomorrow, and I'll, I'll just do a brief summary of who's in it because I don't want to spend too much time on this. Um, and I plan to, unless the Lord calls an audible, I plan to kind of hit some of the highlights from the debate on the program tomorrow unless something else trumps it, which I'm certainly hoping that I get something else to trump it. I, I, just, I just feel like I'm, I'm responsible to give you guys an informed program. So you don't have to suffer through this pain. I'll do it for you. So tonight, starting at, what time is this? 8 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Central. First thing I found interesting is Joe Biden said he was too nice in the first debate. <laughs> Why? Because Kayla Harris caught you in the lights when you about to, you were lying to him, Joe. You wasn't too nice. You was too lie. <laughs> too lie. That's the first thing. The second thing that I find to be absolutely remarkable uh, is that they've banned the p opportunities to ask questions where the candidates raise their hands. You want to know why? <laughs> because in the last debate, in the last debate, the moderators asked the question, and I'm going to say in the moderator voice, who here would be willing to extend your Medicare for All program to asylum seekers crossing the border? And then all of those jokers raised their hand. I'm telling you, I'm not one known to give advice to the Republican Party, but if they have not started yet, they should start their political advertisements with having every Democrat candidate's hand being raised to say, oh, they're willing to take your hard-earned tax money and ignore cities that, I don't know, have rat infestation problems like we talked about yesterday with the size of cats. <laughs> and uh, we talked yesterday at length about how the media was intentionally trying to foment this racial sentiment concerning the rat infestation comment. Because everybody said, talked about Baltimore having rats. Bernie Sanders said Baltimore had rats. Baltimore's mayor was touring her own city. was like, ooh, Lord, you could smell the rats from here. She wasn't even inside a building. I played the audio for you yesterday on the program. They, try to, they, try, they want to spin it because they know criticizing President Trump for being crude, which I think is a legitimate source of criticism, uh, they know that's not going to be effective enough to get people not to vote for him. So, no, we have to do more. So, <laughs> so instead of dealing with the rodent problem, which, by the way, I meant to share this. I had a story. I didn't get to it. Orkin ranked the 10 most rat-infested cities in the country. You know who's in the top 10? Now, this is not from President Trump. This is from Orkin. Orkin, man. Baltimore! <laughs> oh, Lord, I'm telling you, this is funny. Oh, you can't make this stuff up. Baltimore is in the top 10 for the most rat-infested cities in the country. Anyway, stay focused, Abraham. Stay focused. Uh, so all 10 of those jokers raise their hand. Everybody on the debate stage, yes, we would love to rush in to give money to illegal aliens. And who cares about the... The problems in Baltimore, my hometown, New Orleans, Louisiana, you know, the, the poop problem in San Francisco. I mean, you got to have a map. That's a shame, guys. How, a city where you have to have a, you know, they had that, that phenomenon, they had the little game, they people chasing Pokemon. They're running around using, they're all walking, bumping into folks because they're looking at their Pokemon. Where's the Pokemon? Where are the Pokemon? If you visit San Francisco, you want to go to the wharf to get some crab. You know, you want to you get some uh we call them shrimp stateside, but they call them prawns in other parts of the world. You want to get some prawns at the wharf in San Francisco. You better have your poop map. You mess around and step in some human fecal matter. That's a doggone shame in Silicon Valley. But, oh, who cares about all of that? Let the border. Let's, let's just send all of our money to give health insurance, Medicare for all for illegal aliens, all of them. So now you won't see that tonight or tomorrow night. Or in any other Democrat debate going forward. Because they banned that type of question. Because you don't want to get caught with them telling the truth. 
They want to make, and the candidate say, because it doesn't allow us to explain our answer. You mean lie your way out? <laughs> it doesn't allow you to lie your way out. Yes, we want to give Medicare for all to illegal aliens, but not to illegal aliens. That's kind of stuff they want to say. Of course, yeah, I said it intentionally confusingly. They'll use a lot more flowery and more polished words than I just used. But that's what the communicator is. So you won't see that. So let me run, give you a rundown. Some of, you people, some of you don't even know who all these folks are. And, and let, I'm going to just tell you, you don't have to because many of them are going to go away. This is probably going to be the last debate where you have 17,576 candidates because they want to win other field too. So the criteria in order to be a part of this debate, you had to have either one of these two uh, criteria. You either have one, 65,000 individual donors to your campaign, or you have, at, I'm sorry, 65,000 donors to your, ca individual, individual donors to your campaigns with at least 200 donors in 20 different states, or you had to have 1% of the vote in three polls recognized as legitimate by the DNC committee. One of those criteria. If you were like me, I would ask the question, why would you let somebody who has 0% on the debate stage? Just because you can raise money don't mean you can get a vote. You know, that's what me thinks. But anyway, Marianne Williamson, she's known as Oprah's spiritualist guru. Her, her main source of attack on President Trump is she's going to weaponize and politicize love. That's what she said. That's not... We got, I mean, she on the web, she's going to use love as her weapon. All right, Marianne, that's why you're on the far left of the debate stage already, and that's where you're going to stay until they say, all right, no more of Marianne. All right, next, Tim Ryan. You don't know who he is. Tim Ryan is a congressman, for, congressman from Ohio who ran against Nancy Pelosi to become the Democrat Speaker of the House. He lost to Nancy. He's going to lose now. Next, Amy Klobuchar, United States Senator from Minnesota. Her appeal She's a Midwestern woman that could help win back some of those Rust Belt states. The, her hopeful, her hope for appeal. Help win some of those Rust Belt states President Trump won in 2016. Amy, you got 1% of the vote. Take two seats on the left. Next, Pete Buttigieg. Lord, Pete Buttigieg, I guess. Now, here's, here's an interesting fact. You know, Pete Buttigieg has raised the most money so far, even more than Joe Biden. In the last quarter, Pete Buttigieg has got like 25 million in the last quarter. But the problem is, <laughs> Pete Buttigieg can't attract a pretty significant core of the Democrat primary voter base, namely melanated folk. They don't like old Pete. Because you see, Pete, for some folks, not all, you got to have some type of appeal other than you're married to a man. Moving on, next. After Pete, you have Bernie Sanders. He's going to be in the middle. That's a, if you don't know this, with the debates, they put the people who they expect to be the front runners in the center stage is what they called it. So in center stage is going to be Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, and then immediately next to them on Bernie Sanders' right will be Pete Buttigieg, and on Elizabeth Warren's left will be Robert Francis. I told you I'm not going to call this dude Beto. How are you going to jump claim a whole nickname? Want to be Spanish speaker? Who's <laughs> Spanish is horrible. Esto nombre... Qual S2 Nueve. Terrible. Oh, Terrible. But anyway, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren have purportedly have a truce where well, they've agreed not to attack each other too aggressively right now. That's the kind of favor one socialist gives to another. Now, Elizabeth Warren won't say she's a socialist, but all of her policies are identical to Bernie Sanders. Let me hurry up. I don't want to spend all of the time on this. I have something very important I wanted to get to. Because I don't think this is that. I guess I should think this is for you. Was that, is that mic on? Ah. Oh. <laughs> I'm kidding, y'all. I knew it was on. Beto O'Rourke, he has 0%. I don't know if anybody saw the video that's, that's uh, gone viral on social media. Uh, Beto O'Rourke is walking through an airport, and there's a, a, a young lady in the airport, and she says, congratulations, Beto. And you, you see, he's like, oh, wait, somebody knows my name? Nationally? He, he gets all heartened with his face. And she says, congratulations, Beto. And then he goes, on your zero percent. <laughs> His face gets all downcast. <laughs> he storms out of the door. <laughs> That's just what's going to happen to your electoral chances, storming right out of the door. After that, you got John Hicken Hickenlooper, who purports to be a moderate. This is the guy, Jason, you and I talked about. You want to know how moderate John Hick Hickenlooper is? Former Colorado governor? He took his mom to go see a pornographic movie. 
folks, these people are sick. Went with his mom. Anyway, moving on. After that, you have John Delaney, who's a congressman from Maryland. Has no chance. You don't need to know, know who he is. He's not going to win. Then, last for tonight will be Steve Bullock. This will be his first time, the first time on the Democrat debate stage. He is the incumbent governor of Montana. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. He initially won the gubernatorial election in Montana in 2012 with 48% of the vote. And he won re-election in 2016 with a whopping 50.2% of the vote. He tends to think, he tends to think, well, I was able to win a red state. And I'm a Democrat. Nobody knows you, Steve. And, and, and you, somebody need to get him like Rocky's wife in Rocky IV. Steve, you're not going to win. So those are the folks who will be on your debate stage, on the debate stage tonight. Just wanted to let you know a little bit about them. I may get into the next ones on a later date. I don't know because that was painful for me. I don't, know, I don't know. I hope you guys got something out of that because I didn't enjoy that at all. But this is what I really wanted to get to. But I felt like I was duty-bound to convey that to you. And let me start, start with this. This is probably how I'll start this. So you guys know I tend to peruse from time to time. This time I have to give props to Jeff. He dug this jewel up for us. Uh, these TED Talks. I've said before that I think these TED Talks are often like the modern-day Areopagus, where they're an exchange of ideas that many of the regressives believe to be the most cutting-edge ideas of our time. I have been warning from every platform the Lord has afforded me before I came onto the radio uh, about the usage of the discipleship of children. Now, most of you may commonly understand that to be, uh, or let me say it this way, that includes the education of our children. I say that because the biblical notion of discipleship includes within it the training instruction of both the mind and the morals of our offspring. So biblically, there is no bifurcation or separation between the cultivation and the development of spiritual discipline in our young ones and their academic prowess. If we embrace that division, that is a worldly idea. We have swallowed whole hog, whole camel. I posted a story on my social media accounts, a tweet posted by an activist educator, right? But I want you to listen to this clip from a teacher by the name of Sidney Cha Chaffee, who was the 2017 National Teacher of the Year, giving a TED Talk. Here's just a brief clip of her entire talk. Please play clip number one. A few months ago, I logged on to Twitter, as I do, and I saw that a fellow teacher had taken issue with that belief. Teachers, he said, should not be social justice warriors because the purpose of education is to educate. And he, he ended his argument by saying, I teach my subject. But I reject that simplification because teachers don't just teach subjects, we teach people. And when our students walk into our classrooms, they bring their identities with them. Everything they experience in our rooms is bound up in historical context. And so if we insist that education happens in a vacuum, we do our students a disservice. We teach them that education doesn't really matter because it's not relevant to what's happening all around them. And what's happening all around them? Well, racism for one. So yeah, social justice belongs in our schools. Social justice should be a part of the mission of every school and every teacher in America if we want liberty and justice for all to be more than a slogan. Because schools are crucial places for children to become active citizens. Schools are crucial places for children to become active citizens. Mm. Now remember what she began her objective, her objection was to another teacher saying that, oh, I just teach my subject. She said, this is Sydney Chaffee, 2017, teacher of the year. Oh, no. You don't just teach your subject. You're not a good teacher unless you make them active citizens. You want me to translate that for you? Activists. You see? Yeah. Now, here's the question. What kind of activists they're tra are they training? I'll hit you with this one before I go to the break. Hopefully I have enough time to get to it. I think I will. A teacher by the name of Jed, Jed, 
Drew, sorry, Derry Berry tweeted this, quote, new teachers, I'm sorry if we veteran educators have misguided you about the profession. It's not about cute classrooms and trendy ideas. It's political. It's advocacy. It's the front line of battle for the future of our nation. Go no further if you're not ready, end quote. You see, these teachers recognize that the school is used as a tool for sociopolitical indoctrination. Here's American Family Association President Tim Wildman. Lynn Ingram and Jim Duncan, two Texans, support and believe in our ministry here at AFA and AFR. We know more about the laundry business than anything else. We know a little bit about a lot of things, but we know a lot about the laundry and dry cleaning business. They created a laundry detergent to sell to folks to support AFA. We just want to be able to provide a product that can be used by AFA to support the ministry. When you wash your family's clothes with Redeem Clean Laundry Detergent, you can take great satisfaction in knowing that you're supporting the vital work of the American Family Association. It's a unique way to increase your giving to AFA. For clean laundry and support of a cleaner society, it's Redeem Clean. Learn more about the Redeem Clean products when you visit redeemclean.afastore.net. Accurately interpreting scripture. This is David Wheaton, host of The Christian Worldview. If you've ever been in a group Bible study, you have probably heard an attendee say, what this passage means to me is, with all due respect, it matters not one whit what the Bible means to any given person, but rather what God means in the Bible. The goal of studying scripture is to understand God's intent via the human author whom he inspired to write the text. The Christian's call is clear in 2 Timothy 2, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Hear an interview about interpreting scripture at thechristianworldview.org and then tune in this weekend for another topic that will sharpen your worldview. Listen to The Christian Worldview with David Wheaton, Saturday mornings at 8 Central on American Family Radio. Fox News Commentary with Todd Starnes. Hello, Americans. Exposing a double standard. That story next. Former Baltimore Mayor Catherine Pugh was so disgusted by the conditions in her city, she almost became physically ill, telling a reporter she could actually smell the decay of dead rats. Senator Bernie Sanders was left shell-shocked by his visit to Baltimore. This is what he said back in 2015. Anyone who took the walk that we took around this neighborhood would not think you're in a wealthy nation. You would think that you were in a third world country. What we're talking about is a community in which half of the people don't have jobs. We're talking about a community in which there are hundreds of buildings that are uninhabitable. So the former mayor condemned her city. Bernie Sanders compared it to a third world country. President Trump just pointed out the problems and they call him the racist. That's what we call hypocrisy, folks. I'm Todd Starnes. That's your Fox News commentary. The Hamilton Quarter Podcast and One Minute Commentaries are available at AFR.net. Back to the Hamilton Quarter on American Family Radio. Welcome back to the Hamilton Quarter. We will open the phone lines this segment. I can feel the phones already wanting to buzz. The number to call if you want to be a part of the program is 888-589-8840. Once again, that number is 888-589-8840. Four, zero. The topics is based on the text in Ezekiel chapter 3. The gifts of God do not dictate the context for their usage. And in the kingdom of God, we do not evaluate ourselves nor one another, nor society for that matter, the way the world does. Whether God has called you to minister in what the world may describe as anonymity, where you don't have a stage or a platform publicly at all, or whether or not the Lord gives you access to the largest stage in the country. The size of the stage nor the quantity of those present do not determine the quality of the gift and the calling God has given you. That quality is determined by the gift giver alone. Second topic. 
train wreck of a debate. I know it hadn't happened yet, but I can already tell you it's going to be a train wreck. What are your thoughts on that? And third topic, I played a little bit of the audio from Sydney Chafee, 2017's Teacher of the Year, where she says, oh, oh, now we're not supposed to teach children subjects, reading, writing, and arithmetic, ah, hogwash. We're to make them social justice act activists. Did you know that's what the 2017 Teacher of the Year was advocating? Drip, I keep saying this guy's name wrong. <laughs> Let me say it right. Jed Deerberry echoed the same sentiment. I read his tweet. New teachers, I'm sorry if we veteran educators have misguided you about the profession. It's not about cute classrooms and trendy ideas. It's political. It's advocacy. It's the front line of battle for the future of our nation. Go no further if you're not ready. Now, I've been beating this drum for the longest saying, hey, do you realize the word indoctrinate? And, and my friends, Will and Miki, talk about this all the time. Um, the term indoctrinate has only been made to be considered negative when you're trying to raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Because the world has no problems with indoctrinating them into secular humanism. The secular regressivism, which is the only type of regressivism there is, frankly, secular. Or should I say antichrist regressivism? That's a better description. They have no problem with indoctrinating them there. All manner of LGBTQ plus indoctrination. All manner of America is an evil, hateful <laughs> country. All, they, they don't mind indoctrinating them in that way. You know the only time they would bring out the word indoctrinate? When you're trying to raise them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And think about the word for a second. What's the root word of indoctrinate? Doctrine. <laughs> What's the prefix? In. So what we're trying to do is get the doctrine of the Lord in. Sign me up for indoctrination. I'm about that indoctrinate life. Say what you want. But I ain't letting the government get their grubby hands on my children. And I pray with every ounce and fiber of my being that you won't either. Because here's the thing. And I want to try to, to lay this out well. This tweet from Dred Jed Deerberry and that little quip clip from Sidney Chafee, which the whole video, I'm telling you, goodness gracious. But the clip I shared, you might think that that's new. But can I tell you something? That's not new. If you get the American Family Association's action alerts, one of the latest things we shared is that the National Education Association, the largest teachers union in the country with over 3 million members, that are still taking dues from teachers unsuspectingly in spite of the Janus Supreme Court decision that says they can't do that, but they're not letting many of the teachers know that they can opt out. That's a whole other story. But the NEA just signed a resolution supporting abortion. Unfettered access to killing children. Now think about this. You have a teacher's union. You exist to educate children, but you're going to support killing them? What does that have to do with educating them? See, Jed and Sydney told you, it's not about education. It's about activism. But as I said, this isn't new, folks. Let me give you a couple examples. Charles Francis Potter. Talked about him before. Jason, you're going to remember me discussing him in our private conversation. Charles Francis Potter in his 1930 book titled Humanism, A New Religion, said this, quote, Education is thus a most powerful ally of humanism. And every American public school is a school of humanism. What can the theistic Sunday schools meeting for an hour once a week and teaching only a fraction of the children do to stem the tide of a five day program of humanistic teaching? Charles Francis said that in 1930. Well, here we are in 2019. We're still over 90 percent of Christian children. Are being educated by the government. This isn't new, folks. He said that in 1930. Are you here? And listen, everything I say, go and look it up for yourself. I don't want you to ever think just because I said it, you don't need to go and, and, and study for yourself. Go and look it up. His book was titled Humanism, A New Religion. And we have different terms for today, but for things that are happening today, these regressive ideologies. But when you get right down to it, it all is antichrist humanism. It's the contest between God's word or man's word, which one will win. The sexual deviancy, political agenda, uh, intersectionality, <coughs> excuse me, 
the, the, the baby murder advocates, the death cult proponents, it's all saying, did God surely say? That's the contention. That's what it is. I'll give you another one. Dr. Chester Pierce, professor of education at Harvard, addressing the Child Education International Conference in April of 1972. 1972 said this, quote, every child in America entering school at the age of five is mentally ill because he comes to school with certain allegiances to our founding fathers, toward our elected officials, toward his parents, toward a belief in a supernatural being and toward the sovereignty of this nation as a separate entity. It is up to you as teachers to make all of these sick children well by creating the international child of the future. That's in 1972, addressing an international conference of teachers. And you notice he's talking to an international conference audience, but says every American child comes to school sick. How does, how does, that, how does that sit with you? When you, know, when you now know this has been the underpinnings for things that have happened in our country like, oh, I don't know, the removal of the Bible from, as a textbook in our public schools, the elimination of prayer in our public schools, you know, those things that just randomly happened. Folks, it was never random. This has been a 150-plus year plan to de-Christianize America and stop and look around and see whether or not the plan has been successful. I know it's a lot, but I'm going to keep going because my, my prayer here is that we would not keep our heads in the sand, buried in the sand, and say, wait a minute, Abraham, are you telling me this has been a plot? Because one thing I've learned, people don't like being played. It's one thing where people have been wronged. When they find out their being wronged has been the product of a multi, uh, 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 at least a century and a half scheme to set you up. And I know a lot of times people talk about the world stealing our children, but can I tell you something, just a little tidbit from criminal law? It's not considered theft if they've been given permission to access your stuff. If Jason come into my house, comes into my house, and I give him my cell phone, and he uses my cell phone in a way that I don't want him to use it, I can't tell the police Jason stole my cell phone. The police will tell me, well, how did he get access to your cell phone? And guess what I'm going to have to say? I gave it to him. Folks, we cannot complain that the world is stealing our children if we're giving them to the world. A couple more quotes, and I'll be, I'll be done with this section. Because I want you to under, understand the depths of this. In 1971, George Fisher was the president of the National Education Association. And he talked about the plan to control who gets licensed to be teachers. And look what he said. Look at what he said. Quote, a good deal of work has been done to begin to bring about uniform certification controlled by the unified profession in each state. With these new laws, we will finally realize our 113-year-old dream of controlling who enters, who stays, and who leaves the profession. Once this is done, we can also control the teacher training institution. Now, some I know there are some Christian teachers sitting here right now wondering why they haven't been able to, to do what they want to do when helping the children learn a biblical worldview. Did you know it was a 113-year plan? Now, that was in 1971 when he said that. Do quick math. It's been more than 113 years now. I'll give you one more. June 29th, 1938. Actually, two more. Two more. June 29th, 1938. The New York Herald Tribune reported on the NEA convention that was being held in New York City at the time. Dr. Goodwin Watson, a professor of education at the Teachers College at Columbia University, begged the teachers of the nation to use their profession to, here it comes, indoctrinate children to overthrow conservative reactionaries directing American government and industry. Dr. Watson said the Soviet, Ru Soviet Union was one of the most notable international achievements of our generation. One more. John J. Duff Dunphy, in 1983, wrote in a magazine titled simply Humanist. John J. Dunphy said this in 1983, quote, I am convinced that the battle for humankind's future must be waged and won in the public school classroom by teachers. These teachers must embody the same selfless dedication of the most rabid fundamentalist preacher, for they will be ministers of another sort. 
utilizing a classroom instead of a pulpit to convey humanist values in whatever subject they teach. Regardless of the education level, preschool, daycare, or large state university, the classroom must and will become an arena of conflict between the old and the new, the rotting corpse of Christianity, together with all its adjacent evils and misery, and the new faith of humanism. Humanism will emerge triumphant. It must if the family of humankind is to survive. Did you know they were plotting all of that about your children in school? And now some of us are wondering, man, why they don't teach subjects like they used to teach? Why they teach in Common Core? They don't want to teach two plus two equals four. You know, why, why all of a sudden they come with these newfangled ideas? They want to put all the desks together, get everybody sitting together. Why is there such a, 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 a revulsion toward individualism? You know what? Folks, this has been a part of the plan. So when you see Sidney Chaffee popping off at a TED Talk and Jed Deerberry saying that, you know, the classroom is about political activism, they are just repeating which, what really has become educational orthodoxy and government indoctrination complexes for over 100 years. Dr. Michael Brown, a cultural apologist, was writing about the, the, the Dreadberry, the Deadberry tweet, and he said this to conclude his article, and I'm going to say this, and then we'll get to the phone line. He said, the left, quote, the left understands that the schools are the front line of the battle for the future of our nation. The question is, do we? If so, then what are we going to do about it? End quote. You know, the UCLA University just put out a study. Well, not just. This study came out in 2017, actually. That said in California right now, one out of every four children ages 12 through 17 identifies themselves as gender nonconforming. One out of four. It's actually, actually more than one out of four. It's 27%. That's before this most recent education framework was adopted in California. Can you imagine what that's going to be after children in kindergarten, four-year-olds, are being introduced to transgenderism? Can you imagine how that will sweep over the rest of the country? Listen, I'm echoing Dr. Brown's sentiment. This is what is happening, folks. The left understands the importance of discipleship. Do we? And if we do, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? To the phone lines we go. We'll start in Mississippi with Quinn, who's called the program. Quinn, thank you for calling the Hamilton Corner. Welcome to the program. Oh, yeah. Thank you for taking my call, Abe. Um, I appreciate you talking about these important uh, subjects. Um, uh, I make uh, under $30,000 a year. And I, you know, I hear a lot of people talk about they can't uh, homeschool uh, because um, they have too much bills or something like that. Well, my wife is a stay-at-home mom, and she uh, teaches our three children. And, uh, you know, all I make is it's under 30000 a year. And, you know, sure, I'd like to have a nicer car and, and, you know, bigger house and boats and four-wheelers, but it's more important to us to... Uh, I don't know what happened, Quinn, but thank you for your call. We got right, disconnected. Uh, it's true, you know. I know... Life is hard. We all have very difficult circumstances in various ways. But can I tell you something? For the most part, the things that we prioritize, we actually pursue. And I'm saying, man, what is it going to take for us to recognize what is happening? You know, there's lots of conversation about, you know, people stealing our children and taking our nation. Can I tell you something? Nobody's taking our nation. We're giving it to them in the form of our children. We're giving it to them. How long do we have to continuously experience our young people becoming educated only to stand in our faces and tell us that your faith is yours and I don't share it to, before we recognize where do they get that from? Faith comes by hearing. So does a lack of faith. I'll try to squeeze one more in. One more call in Tennessee. Kelvin, thank you for calling the show. You have 10 seconds. Please go and the teaching that you gave us this, uh, this afternoon. And I just want to quickly say and exhort all of God's people that God said he, he's going to dispel the illusion that's being cast on society. Amen. We got to leave it right there, Kelvin. Is enough enough for us? 
The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast may not necessarily reflect those of the American Family Association or American Family Radio.